We're going to start, yeah, we're Second Kings 4 is where we're starting once, once we get going here. 20, uh, 38. All right. Well, I don't remember this ever. That's why we're doing the Lost Stories, is nobody remembers. These aren't in arts books. Oh, I do. Were those Missouri Synod? Uh, what's that? Course. Who published those? Archbooks, Concordia Publishing House. I, I remember that very well. <laughs> All right, let's begin with prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks for gathering us together around your word tonight. We ask you, Lord, to be present with us as we read it and help us to understand it. So we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, so tonight is uh, Bad Stew and Feeding an Army. So let's look at Second Kings. I'm sorry, did I say First Kings? I should have said Second Kings, you okay. said. Good. Second Kings 4 38. And Elisha came again to Gilgal when there was a famine in the land. And as the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, he said to his servant, Set on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. One of them went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it uh, his lap full of wild gourds oh, and came and cut them up into the pot of stew, not knowing what they were. Oh. And they poured out some of them for the men to eat. But while they were eating of the stew, they cried out, O man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat it. He said, Then bring flour. And he threw it into the pot and said, Pour some out for the men that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. Mm. A man came from Baal Shalashah, bringing the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley, and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And Elisha said, Give to the men that they may eat. But his servant said, How can I set this before a hundred men? So he repeated, Give them to the men that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left. So he set it before them, and they ate and had some left, oh, according to the word of the Lord. That's amazing. All right, so uh, starting out here, uh, we have two miracles uh, performed by Elisha. Elisha and Elijah performed a number of, of miracles during their years of, of being prophets. Um, we're told here that they're in the midst of a famine. Uh, you know, in our world, we don't really understand the reality of famine. Uh, hey, Val. Hey, Bill. Uh, Second Kings 4. That's where we are. We just finished reading Second uh, Kings 4, 38 through 44. Um, we thought, you know, we got all been out of shape when, when we could only buy one, roll of, one package of toilet paper at a time. You know, you would have thought that the world was coming to an end. You know. Luckily, I had I had been to Costco just before the pandemic, so we had ninety rolls in our garage. <laughs> ninety. Yeah, yeah. I bought I bought three packages, you know, three of the big things. So I felt like a hoarder, but I, but I honestly did it before they they were running out. Um, so, but imagine going to the store and really literally having no food uh, on the stores, uh, on the uh, shelves of the store at all, um, even at the height of COVID which is probably our closest thing uh, to, to, to be able to imagine what a famine's like. Uh, even at the height, there was, there was plenty of food to buy. It might not have been food that you particularly wanted, or it might, have been not, not, might not have been fresh food, it might have been canned or something like that, but there was food, you know. Uh, think of needing to feed your family and there literally being no food available anywhere. Uh, we have in the, uh, in the city of Chicago, uh, we have what's called food deserts, uh, places in the city where you there's no grocery stores. Uh, you have maybe a couple of convenience stores uh, that sell, you know, <laughs> garbage mostly. You know, mostly junk food kind of stuff. Um, and uh, but no grocery stores uh, for miles in any direction. Uh, and 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 think of that uh, if you are a person dependent upon public transportation. Oh, that's terrible. And, and yeah. you can't, you know, you, you can't get to a food place. Uh, it's just, it's really difficult. I, I've over the years of doing servant events in the city, you know, I've run across so many. Uh, I mean, it usually affects uh, young mothers with children. I mean, that's who it affects the most. Uh, is that trying to get someplace, mm -hmm. working 
eight hours a day, getting on the bus then and and taking the bus for half an hour, 45 minutes to a place where there's a grocery store, you know, uh, and then, I mean, even that, that's assuming you're a person who makes enough money to afford groceries, you know, which a lot of people can, you know, but they still have to do this. They have to get out of the food desert. So one of the, uh, what is that flying around? It really likes you. Yeah, I know. Uh, one of the uh, big uh, political initiatives for a while, I don't know if it still is or not, but there for a while, I think it was in a Rahm Emanuel, where I heard about it the first time, was trying to encourage grocery stores to build in these areas where there's where they have food deserts. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, then we ended up with the riots that that a lot of them, the ones that were there, pulled out. Yep, you yeah, know, blame because them. they their their place wasn't protected. So yeah, it's just we just you know we just have it is so we are so blessed in our lives. You know, I mean, my big complaint is I have to drive all the way down to the end of Main Street to get to the grocery store. You know, that's my big complaint. And I was so irritated because the Prairie Food Co-op, you know, was supposed to go in at the corner there where that stupid uh, coffee shop went in instead at the corner of uh, Maine and... Oh, the Muslim coffee shop. Yeah, the Muslim coffee shop. It's actually Muslim women something. It's M-O-M-W-O-C, something like that. The Prairie Food. And it was supposed to be the Prairie Food Co-op. It was supposed to go there. Yeah, but he was sponsored. I know. I mean, I could have walked to the the store. I don't even know what the Prairie Food is. I don't even know what that is. It's a hippie thing. It's a co-op. It's a food co-op. <laughs> so, so basically what food co-ops do is you buy into them, you get the community to buy into them, and then they support local growers and things like that. It's, I mean, you basically get more local produce as much as possible, more local beef, things like that. It's just, you know, I didn't care what it was. I just was excited about having a grocery store. I remember you were upset that, with Mr. C's. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I closed yeah. Mr. C's. Why? I, I, was the one, I was the one man closed it. The last customer? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I was, I was so irritated with them because they wouldn't take my check. After I'd been in there for years, and I forgot my, my, I got down there, I forgot my wallet, but I had my checkbook, which is weird because I never had my checkbook, but I had my checkbook in my pocket. I said, oh, I can write a check. Well, do you have a Mr. Z's check cashing card? Oh, no. no, I don't have. Well, you can't. We can't take a check unless you have a check cashing card. Would you like to fill out this, you know, fourteen-page paperwork in order to? I said, no, nope, never mind. I just walked away, left everything on the belt. <laughs> well, I don't know if you've noticed. I know this isn't a grocery store, it's just, but if you've noticed, a lot of the Seven Elevens are going out of business in Lombard. No, no, no I know a, about the one the, in Eastgate. They were robbed. Okay, so let me, the one in Eastgate, and then there's the one on Madison right, in Maine. it's gone. So I was in the one right by the train station, yeah. um, and I was talking, and I'm standing there, and this homeless guy, or some guy, comes in, my stuff is, I'm taking this, and he just takes a bunch of stuff, and fills a big gulp, and walks out, and I'm like, of course I'm up in arms, you know yeah. me, yeah. and I say to the guy, what, what was that, and he's like, it's not even worth doing anything. And it's like, this is the shame. I mean, this is why these places... I mean, I know we're not talking about stuff. I'm not talking grocery stores. But, I mean, if we're allowing this to happen, how could anyone stay in business if people can just go really in? It's, it's yeah. happening at Michigan It's happening Avenue. everywhere. That's what in Michigan saying. Avenue, yeah. the really high-priced stores, they're just breaking into them, uh-huh. getting stuff, and they're gone before... They know the police won't sure. be there for 20 minutes. So, not... Yeah. Uh, you know, just thinking about... How, how comfortable we are with being able to go get food anytime we want, being able to, we have Grubhub, we have, uh, you know, all these food places that we can just order from on the phone and have it delivered. Uh, it's hard to even imagine a famine, but that's what they're in the middle of uh, at this point. Uh, well, that 7-Eleven by the train station is single-handedly funded by Neil, so <laughs> it's never going away. Yeah. That's what Sarah says. Yeah. Well, that's too bad. <laughs> it's a good yeah, he does. That's he. He, no, the Seven Eleven by the train station is there. It's still I, there. Yeah, I was just as a train. Yeah, he he spends a lot of time so. at Seven Eleven. That's a good uh, one. They got cookies now. They're only a dollar for two. <laughs> let me tell you, they'll knock your socks off. So, um, in the midst of the famine, uh, the prophets who were following Elisha also needed to be fed. That's what's called the, the sons of the prophets. So, whenever you see the sons of the prophets, it's a, it's basically a prophet school. It's this it's Elisha Seminary. Oh. You know, and that's the way you that's the way you learned in that day is you found somebody who would who would allow you to follow. I mean, that's what we see with Jesus, right? 
the disciples or people who follow a rabbi and you follow this rabbi and, and you learn. Uh, it's kind of funny because, you know, we're coming full circle uh, in the world. And that's, you know, I don't know if you've heard of the SMP program in the no. Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, it's a specific ministry pastor. So if you need a, a second pastor or uh, or if there's a small congregation, like say, uh, let's let's say a, a Messiah, you know, which is a very small congregation, needed a pastor. Well, what we could do is we could, uh, and we had somebody who said, boy, I always, always wanted to be a pastor, but I can't move my family to St. Louis or Fort Wayne for four years. I just can't do it. Uh, so now we have the SMP program, which is where you are a, a, a person who you connect with a local pastor. Hey. I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you know a man that walks into the church and only speaks Spanish? And I don't speak enough Spanish to help you. We can move to translate? That's right. I think that's what he was going to pull up. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll figure out what he said. <laughs> I speak enough Spanish to order, you know, a beer. <laughs> order a beer and ask where the bathrooms are, and <laughs> uh, and I can understand. I can understand more than I can speak. But uh, I've been li I've been a book I've been reading uh, has a lot of Spanish, and it's been kind of fun because I've I'm really starting to pick up a lot listening to it, but trying to speak it's a whole other word. Um, Anyway, uh, where was I? Oh, the sons of the prophets. So we've come full circle now. Is that is that the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate is saying we got to find a way to train pastors that does not require four years at the seminary. And so back in 2007, they passed the SMP program. It hasn't really done what we were hoping for it to do. We are hoping uh, for pastors in like local in, in communities where there's a big church where there's also like tiny churches that, you know, for helping that tiny church raise up somebody within that church to serve them, really what it's been, it's become is more uh, the big churches uh, getting assistant pastors cheap, you know. And, and now Roselle, I have to say that Trini Roselle has done a kind of interesting job of um, using their SMPs to serve. Sorry, Trini, again, he actually went to talk to you. I told him to go teach Yeah, tell him to call my secretary and make an appointment. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yep. We don't do this. Pop in and talk to the pastor business. Um, I know that sounds cold, but if I if I stopped every time, every time a homeless person stopped in to tell me their story, and I can't help them. Mm -hmm. uh, if they go through Margaret, they find out. Oh, he's not going to give me any money. So, I mean, we're going to send him uh, to um, Love Inc. That's the 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 organization we fund Ooh. and then and uh, the outreach center in Lombard. We fund those two organizations with money and and goods. And so that's what we do is we send everybody there. There uh, was kind of well, the, the Thursday women's well said one time this this girl walks in, she's probably about twenty five, messed up, you know, like wanting to like hang out in here. And of course, you know, I wasn't very nice, the woman being me and even though I probably should have been, I should have been nicer. I know, I know. I, I regretted it the next morning. Um, Daniel was nice. Daniel was there with me. Yeah. Um, but she's like, I need to charge my phone. And I was like, this isn't just anyone walking in the street. She yeah. goes, isn't this a church? Yeah. <laughs> like that. And I'm like, it doesn't mean everyone can just come in and set up shop. Yeah. Like, but yeah. I can imagine that a lot of people come with that attitude. Like, it's a church. Yeah. I can use it for, I can and that's not do what I want. Works. Yeah. Yep. And I can, that's how we have that problem at the parking lot too. Yeah. Is it was yeah. all parking? Probably put our our uh, you know work vehicles and our mm -hmm. extra vehicle, and and that's usually fine. Most of the time, we don't care. Uh, it's just nice if you would. Uh, what? No, I'm not dealing with this. Tell him no. Who is the guy? Tell him what's, if he, what's the emergency? Is he if he has an emergency, call no, 911. He's not. he's not. He's a very clean, yeah. well presented. Well, no. He just needs to. He needs to come during business hours, like everybody else. And if it's a big emergency, call nine one one or go to the hospital. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, I I got burned too many times with this in earlier ministry, uh, like the time when the social worker called me and said, "Did you help? Did you give Marquette Wilson money?" I said, "No, I did not. I I paid Marquette Wilson's landlord." because I was not going to give her. I was very proud of myself that I had not given her money, even though she wanted it, and I gave her. He says, no, he says, you paid her pimp. <laughs> Whoa! Oh, my God! And, and they, she said, please don't do that anymore. 
Please, wow. uh, if, if anyone asks you for help, please send them to the Department of Human Services or, you know, the uh, shelter or some of that. But please do not give them money because you just paid her pimp. Uh, and it was like three, four hundred dollars. That's a lot of money. Yeah. I thought I was doing the right thing. And I said, mm -hmm. okay. I got burned another time at Children's Hospital in Seattle. Uh, this person came and had a child at the hospital and needed help and blah, 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 long story. And I called the hospital. I checked it. Yep, the child's there. Yep, that's exactly what the situation with the child. Uh, yep, that's what the parents' names are. Okay, good. I'm good. They had a whole thing going with the cleaning crew. At the night cleaning crew would go through and get the names of the children and the families off oh the charts. Oh and then go around. This, this group from the cleaning crew would go around to the churches the next day and get money. Oh, they pretend to be the... Yeah, and they knew all the answers because they had read mm -hmm. the charts. Yeah. yeah. Which was right. unethical, but they did it anyway. Right. I would see where you would have to put boundaries. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So I, when I came here, I said, no, we're not doing this. <laughs> we're not ever giving money to anyone. Plus, I had a weird email from your yeah. email I always, account, which I knew it wasn't you. Or just didn't tell I always me. tell like people, if, if I'm not asking for cash, don't bother. <laughs> I don't want gift cards. <laughs> Just send me cash. They did that I called Chassie. Chassie. No, yeah. They did that yeah. to Chassie. Like, and they, they, they were all excited. Oh, poor Chassie. And she's so sweet. You know, she's always going to want to help. And yeah. yeah, she's not mean like me. Mean and, <laughs> mean and jaded. Well, Aldo kept texting back and forth whoever that person was uh -huh. for like a week. Like messing with them. I'm like, would you cut that yeah. off? Yeah. You don't know who this guy is. Yeah. yeah. Who it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, of course. Oh, the dolly. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I'll make you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> the totally family. Is that your, is that your yeah. husband? It's That's her husband. son in law. Son okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. He's a great guy. Yes, he's awesome. Okay, um, so in the midst of the famine, the prophets there they, they, with Elijah, they need to be fed. So Elijah tells them, hey, start boiling some water. And basically what we have, have here is stone soup. Remember the old, the, the children's story, stone mm -hmm. soup? They'll start boiling some water and we'll put in what we can find. And they went out to get whatever plants they could find or roots or whatever. And one of them found some gourds. And we think these gourds are something called colocynth, which is poisonous in large amounts. Uh, Colocynth has been banned by the FDA since the early 90s, just so you know. Uh, it's still used, though, in the Middle East for all kinds of homeopathic me medicine. So you always have to be real careful if you're getting anything from the Middle East to make sure if they see if they have colocynth in it. Because it's a gourd that grows wild, uh, and well, the, the stuff, I don't know what the gourd's called, but the stuff they get out of it is called colocynth. All right, so somehow someone... And they called on Elijah because this was the only food they had. Uh, it's kind of funny, uh, you know, the, the, stew, the stew's poison. Why are they calling Elijah? <laughs> I mean, why? Why Elisha? Because he, he, God hears his prayers. Because they have such confidence that he is connected to God. Okay? Um, so it, it's kind of funny because, you know, prophets often don't have the same confidence in themselves that their people have in them. Okay? I mean, because they know they're just human beings. And yet the people see that they're, the people who follow them see that they are connected to God. You know? And so they come to, to the prophet and they sometimes get very angry with the prophet <laughs> if, if he doesn't deliver, you know? Uh, I mean, and that's where you get some, like Jeremiah, you know, who said, you know, just let me die, Lord. Uh, Hosea, you know, same thing, jo Jonah, they're all, they all just go sit under a tree somewhere at some point and say, okay, I'm done. This, you know, there I'm was done. the one prophet. Though, Elijah, not, too. Not, mm -hmm. Elijah, no, yeah. not, not this one, the Elijah. Right, the one before the, this one. He, they doubted him, and he yeah. got the shoe bears after him. Right. No, that's well, Elisha. Oh, that's okay. Elisha, yeah. Who, okay. who, yeah the boys, uh, that was, we did that three or four weeks ago. five Months um, ago. Months ago, I mean. Uh, yeah, that was Elisha. But also. they doubted him, and they gave mm -hmm. him a hard time, and he had no patience for that. Right, that was right. great. Right, yep, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, and they doubt what they doubted was God. You know, okay. that's that was uh, Elisha. It doesn't. It's not so much about whether they doubt him or not, but when they, they were mocking his his Got faith, it. they were mocking God. 
Um, and this is what we're going to talk about next time we meet, time after, depending on how far we get tonight. But we're going to we're going to talk about what happens to people who mock God. Um, sometimes uh, we're very impatient, you know, with with people, and we we see people uh, mock God, we hear people mock God, uh, and we want to go in and just you know kick him in the teeth, and uh, and we're not very you know vengeance is mine saith the Lord. Uh, it's not our place. Mm -hmm. And I always think of, of uh, Jan uh, Gedmark Cox, my supervisor on CPE, who looked at me and said, your God must be very... Uh, and I've always thought of that, is that I don't have to defend him. He's God. If you want to mock God, I don't want to be in your shoes. And I'm going to step away from you because I, if that lightning bolt comes through, <laughs> I don't want to be anywhere close. But that's up to you. Um, so and says, "Hey, fix this. Uh, the food's poison." Now Elisha throws flour into the pot, and the poison vanishes. Okay, this is not a lesson on how to <laughs> clean poisoned food. Okay, that is not yeah. the purpose of this. We had uh, Danya and I had a uh, a lady in our congregation when we served in the Quad Cities, and uh, her name was Fern. I don't remember Fern's last name, but I was Fern cracked me up. And her children all told stories about Fern when she died. Uh, they were sitting around telling stories, and all of them had the same story about how if you got a cut, she would pack it with flour. And then when you got to the emergency room, scrub all the flour out. <laughs> Ooh, that would hurt. And they would run from her, and they wouldn't tell her if they had an injury because they were afraid they'd get it packed with flour. And was that because of this? No, this is because... Flour? Well, I mean, flour will stop bleeding, you know, so it's not a, it's not a, if you're, if that's all you have mm -hmm. and you have massive bleeding, well, sure, you know, that you do what you have to do. But I mean, she would pack flour and everything, you know, but so this is, we, <laughs> it was hilarious hearing those kids talk about it. Um, so you got to remember this, you know, he throws flour and he tells them to throw flour in the pot. They do. The stew is cleansed, but that's not the point of this. It tells us how to clean stew that's been poisoned. This is a miracle from God, and it's a miracle using a very common staple from the Israeli diet. Okay, that, remember that, that of uh, all the things they ate, but holy cow, the infection rate was sky high yeah, from the packing of flour, right? Dr. Billy, who chimed in. Apparently, she doesn't agree with that. She uh, never had to do that. Yeah, apparently, she doesn't pack flour in people's wounds. She's, an she's, not an, she's not an ER doc. She's an, she just knocks people out. Yeah. She's the person who knocks you out while you get the flour scrubbed out. <laughs> um, so it's a, I think it's significant here. I think flour is very significant uh, because... We always, um, at human beings, not we around the table, but human beings in general, tend to look for grand and glorious things. You know, we want the grand and glorious. Remember, remember Moses in the uh, in at Meribah, and and what, what? Why did he get in trouble with God? That he ended up not being. A... We hit the rock. Is and, that what you're talking? About? Yeah, and, and, and he struck. And him. what was he supposed to do? He was supposed to wave it over the rock? No, he was supposed to speak. Speak, speak. Yeah, he was oh, supposed to say, the speak. Lord, the Lord, O oh Lord, give forth water from this rock. But he didn't think that was quite dramatic enough. <laughs> and so he smacked the rock too, you know. And the point, and the whole point was, you didn't do what I told you to do. That was God's point. Is that, and God is very, uh, you know, is very serious about that. Oh, those sons of Aaron, you know those guys, right? Right. Uh, Aaron about, was Moses' brother, right? Okay. Abidab is one or something like yeah. that. They, God killed them because... He killed them? Yes, mm -hmm. because they did something without God's command. Mm -hmm. Yeah, strange. Well, the fire. guy, remember the guy who tried to, to balance the ark so it didn't fall over? He touched it. He was told, they were told, don't touch the ark. He touched it, dropped dead. And Anna mm -hmm. and Sapphira, you know, told, came, came and said, oh, we've sold our land and given it all to the church. They lied. They lied. They dropped dead. There well, are people the, that lie in churches It today. wasn't the point. The point is never, uh, well, you know, you're, you're a bad person, so you get you punished with death. The point is, when God says, do this, either do it or don't do it, but don't lie about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? That's why I always tell people is that, you know, when you're talking about the scriptures, all I want to agree on with you 
is do we agree that this is what the scriptures say? Okay, can we agree there? Um, I don't know if you, do you guys watch Charlie Kirk ever. I love Charlie Kirk because because of the argument. I mean, he he happens to be very conservative, and I like that. But what I really like about him is he's his argumentation is so logical and intelligent. He just wants you to be logical, and and if you can, if you're logical, then we can come to some agreement, right? And we can we can find the point where we disagree. If you're logical and I'm logical, and we just pursue down the path, we'll get to that point where oh, here's where we disagree. And then maybe we'll walk away and say, well, we're never going to agree on that. Uh, okay, we, we tried. Uh, or maybe we'll say, oh, I never knew that. I have to rethink this whole thing because I didn't know that. I wasn't aware of that. You know, that's why it's so frustrating uh, talking. Uh, it's, it's, it's frustrating talking to a uh, person who, uh, who doesn't, who just kind of says, well, I, I pick and choose whatever I want to believe in as opposed to somebody who has fundamental differences in belief. I can, I can enjoy talking to somebody who has a fundamental difference in belief and knows why they believe what they believe. And I can say, okay, I understand that. You know, that makes sense. Uh, if I'm talking to uh, um, Father, um, gosh, I can never remember, Rosenbaum. Father Rosenbaum across the street, we get to the point where he says, well, I believe that because that's the papal edict from 1589. Oh, okay. Okay, that makes me believe that the Pope was infallible, or if I believed that the Pope was higher than any other bishop, then I would agree with you. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that, so that's why we don't agree on this, you know, whatever that, whatever it is. Um, but it's, it's, I just love the, the logical arguments make so much more, are, are so much more enjoyable. And then you can listen to them if they're rational, and, there's some thought right. behind them. And, and then, you know, emotion. I don't you know, have, a, no right. Heart. I don't have a need that everybody has to agree with me. Mm -hmm. I just want to know if you don't agree with me, why? I just want to know where the, where the logical dis, departure is because I might want to rethink my position. You know, maybe you're right. It's always good yeah. to learn if it's actually logical. Exactly. I told this one, my one friend, her boyfriend, Gary, is 85-year-old, flaming liberal. Um, you know, he, you know, that finally the other day, he, every time his, his you know, partner calls me or he'll call me and I finally told him because he wants to start po talk politics but it's not like tell me what about Kamala Harris's policies you like you mm -hmm. know what don't what do you think she could do you know what mm -hmm. it's always did you hear what Trump for it was the January 16th and finally yeah. I told him I said I do not want to talk about politics anymore with you that's what I told him Great. and then he picks up and he's like well <laughs> right. I mean, I, I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm done. I can't, I can't listen to it anymore. It, it's, it's not logical and it's not fun to listen to. It's right. like aggravating. And there's, you know, the, the ad hominem argument, which happens on both sides of it, is so frustrating. I mean, that is just such a violation of the Eighth Commandment. To, you know, the Eighth Commandment tells us we put, put the best construction on everything. No matter what we hear, we put the best construction on it. So if I hear that Jamie's knocking over the 7-Eleven at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to say, I, I, I don't, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound right. I'm going to assume that she was in there buying milk. And yeah, it's a little odd to be in there at 2 o'clock in the morning, but I'm going to assume that they ran out of milk and, and Wade had to have a bowl of, to of Cocoa Krispies. Well, that yeah. might actually happen. Yeah, I mean, that would be a logical, actually a logical conclusion. So, you know, I mean. What's the Eighth Commandment again? Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. But Luther's meaning for that is we should fear and love God so that we do not defame or slander our neighbor, but put the best construction on everything. Okay. I, think, I think now it says explain everything in the kindest way. Okay. Uh, he's, 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 the goal he's, is, the, is the, the goal is never, is never to say anything about another human being uh, that's going to tear them down unless you have no other choice. You know, if, if that's your only if, if that's your your only choice to to hurt to help somebody or save somebody or something like that sometimes you're you know like for instance in court you know in court if you're a if you're a um, criminal attorney uh, or, a, or a prosecutor you're gonna have to say things that tear people down in order to get the facts out there to allow the judge to make a judgment right but I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, that is not the case for us. We do not have to say negative things about people. 
we choose to say negative things about people because it makes us feel better or it makes us feel justified in our position or whatever like that. So when I just called that guy a flaming liberal, I broke the Eighth Commandment. Right. Okay. So <laughs> According to Luther, I disagree yeah. with Luther 100%. Yeah. You do? Yes. Okay. Well, I think that he just made he's that He's right. Up. I do kind of feel bad and when I say greatest, stuff like that. He's you like know, the so biggest slanderer not... ever. He is? Right. Luther yeah, Jesus, <laughs> what, you can't, you can't, that's, that's a spurious argument to say, I'm going to make my argument based on how other people act. The, the well, word I'm is the word. The one who Does Jesus said, say, love God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul, love your neighbor as yourself? It does. Yes. Therefore, if I speak negatively about a person, am I loving him? No. No. Unless I'm there's not. no other possible Unless way. there's no other possible way to, to, to deal with it. Because I'm in court. I'm an attorney. I have to present this. Okay. You know, otherwise, you know, you just you, you just don't do it. And and the thing is, is that the reason the genius of Luther in, in explaining everything in the kindest way or, or put the best construction on everything, think man who was just starting uh, in his ministry, really. Uh, he was he was ordained in um, fifteen I can't remember now, 1511, 1510, something like that. So, and this is written in, say, 1529. So he hasn't been doing it a long time. Uh, and, but, he, but, man, could you solve all the problems in the church if you could just get people to stop talking about each other in a negative way? You know, I mean, and, and, and I'm not throwing stones in a glass house here. I, all of us do it. All of us do it before we think about it. Well, all of a sudden, we're talking about somebody in a negative way, and, and we're like, oh, because it's, because it's not necessary. Uh, you know, it's not necessary as to what my opinion is of that person's beliefs or whatever. Um, I, I, that's unnecessary. So uh, back to, the, I mean, Luther, that's why, I think that's why Luther, one of his geniuses, was understanding that, uh, how the Eighth Commandment works to build relationships. And to, in, because if I'm, if I'm trying to talk to somebody who's, who's, categorically opposed to me on all kinds of levels, uh, throwing stones is never going to get anywhere. I can only build the relationship in hopes of either learning why I'm wrong or helping him to learn why he's wrong, one or the other. But, the, but if I don't build the relationship, nothing's ever well, going to happen. I, I disagree on that, too. Well, I you're wrong. To say. You can disagree all day, but you're wrong. Because Jesus' example is he told the Pharisees what they were. They were snakes, snakes, vipers, sons of He Satan. called them out where it was necessary. Jesus is Jesus, and I'm not Jesus. Yeah, but he's our example, too. Yeah. But Jesus is not our example. Jesus is our Lord. Mm -hmm. okay? okay? And I'm not Jesus. So I'm not going to try to be Jesus because, uh, because I'll get it wrong. Just same thing as trying to tell when people want to know, well, do you think so-and-so is going to hell? Not my job. Not my. You do not want me making that call. I will screw it up and have the wrong people in the wrong place. Okay, because because there's a lot of people who I'm sure I'm going to get to heaven. I'm going to say, man, how did you make it? You know. And there's some people that they're, 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 they're aren't going to be there. I'm going to say, where's so and so? He was such a nice guy. I didn't have faith. Your flies back. I know. <laughs> it's it's all all based on faith. Either you, you are saved by grace through faith, no other way, okay? No other way. So uh, Elijah, Elisha here uses, uses flour. We, uh, we were talking about this, about how we like the big miraculous shows. And, and taking something as simple as flour is amazing to fix this, but uh, it's also... Uh, indicative of how important, you know, flour is a, is a really important thing. You can't make bread without flour. And the Israelites lived on bread. I mean, even to this day. And you go to Palestine and Israel from people who have been there. I have never been there. But Wheat bread? Yeah, people say that, that bread is just like everywhere. Every meal has bread. I mean, I've watched some cooking. I watch cooking shows, you know. And I've watched some cooking shows from... Uh, where they go in to, and they have Palestinian uh, people cook Palestinian dishes and, 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 and Jewish people cook Jewish dishes. And they're bread, 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 bread. I mean, I'd be in heaven. I'd also weigh 700 pounds. Yeah. But, you know, but I love bread. And that's the, and, and that's the, the staple here. So you think of flour 
Now think of the, this, the simplest ingredients like water and wine and bread, right? How does Jesus come to us? Mm. Water, wine, bread. Mm. Simplest things in the world. The kids every year in confirmation, when, when the, the first time when we talk about baptism and the new ones here, where baptismal water comes from, they're always shocked and disappointed because there's so many times they think, where do you get baptismal water? Um, is it from the Jordan River? No. <laughs> no, it comes out of the faucet. Yeah, it comes out of the faucet. That's where baptismal water comes from. There's nothing that makes it holy other than the Word of God in a baptism. So that's like on Sunday mornings, yeah, I put water in the font for people to remind themselves of their baptisms. And at the end of the service, we throw it out, but we don't dump it down in the drain. That's we put question. it on the ground. Where, where do you do you put it down the special drain? We just put it in the ground. Well, the, the, the special drain goes. The special to the drain ground. goes in the okay, drain, but we don't have the a special. You're supposed to put the wine in the special. Yeah, we don't drain have too. a special drain. We so we just pour it out on the ground. Oh, you don't have that special one. No, oh. no, no. You know what happens to those special ones? It goes into the ground. Yeah, no. Over <laughs> over about twenty years of pouring mm -hmm. wine down the special ones, they clog up. And then you have to try to route them out or dig up a leaching field. It's terrible. Okay. So we never put in the special one. <laughs> and we just go out and pour it out on the, in, the, in the garden. You can't dump yeah. it down the drain. No, because it's can't. supposed to go back to the earth, right? You it's can't. Been but, you know, I mean, know it's been set aside for a holy purpose. Right, yeah. And so while we don't believe that the wine has been changed into anything or the water has been changed into anything, it has been set aside for a vehicle of the Holy Spirit, which means like, you know, it seems that you don't really want to dump that into the sewer, you know, the city sewer system. Yeah. So we pour it into the ground, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, you know, back to the earth it goes. Uh, so like, even like with my uh, communion kit that I use for homebound people, sometimes, you know, if, I've, if it's been a few weeks and the wafers are stale, I, I just crush them up and, and put them out on the ground, you know, or, so, you know, the Catholics, they believe it's actually been turned into the body of mm -hmm. the, the blood of Christ. And they believe right. you're literally drinking Christ's physical, blood. Right. So they have a real special dream. And my mm -hmm. cousin, I told you the story where they were doing the common cups. She was the Eucharist minister, and they 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 made her drink it yeah. with all the bits. Yep. All the little, after everyone mm -hmm. in the church, like all the little I do every bits. Sunday. Every you Sunday. You finish it? Mm -hmm. I thought you did. You I finish it, really? Mm-hmm. You finish the mm -hmm. what's in the chalice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, M mostly just to make it easier on the altar guild, because otherwise they have to go outside and dump it out. And it's sometimes in, you know when it's twenty below outside, you know. Right. So usually just to make it easier on the altar guild, but mm -hmm. but it's also a nice custom to where it's all consumed. So everything yeah. in the chalice yeah. is consumed. Mm -hmm. uh, everything in the paten is saved to the next week. Mm -hmm. So the bread is saved for the next week because the bread doesn't go bad or anything, uh, or just in a few weeks, you know. Uh, but the uh, patent, but the chalice, the, you can't save that wine. It's been it's been used, and touched and all that. So it has to, uh, you know. Of course, I my, I love the uh, people who who are just death on individual. Cup, I mean, common cup. You know, I don't care if you like taking common cup. That's fine. If you like to get individual cup, that's fine. You do what makes you most comfortable. That's fine. But I do laugh at people who try to tell me how the. Uh, individual cup is so much more sanitary. As I as I watch the altar guild pulling the cups apart, yeah, <laughs> them sure, yeah. their fingers are all over them. Mm -hmm. and, mm, okay, you believe whatever you want to believe. Um, let's see. Who am I getting? This? Oh, oh let's see. And the altar guild appreciates that. <laughs> Jenny says, "Yeah." So yeah, I mean it's it's we have to we can't we got to be not be so silly about stuff like that um yeah G, uh, sarah says uh and the times jesus says things that might be quote unquote negative i.e brood of vipers he does it lovingly for their own good yeah and, and again he's jesus he uh, you know when i when i speak negatively to somebody i don't know how it's going to be uh hell uh, heard I, I i don't know what effect it's going to have he does he knows exactly what to do. I mean, I wish I had that. I wish people had a little, you know, red light on their forehead to tell me, oh, they need law. Okay, you know, a little green light. Oh, they need gospel. Yeah, it would be great, you know, but it's not. So, um, so yeah, so water, wine, bread, such common, ordinary things. Jesus didn't say, take, eat this caviar. This is my body. 
He took regular old unleavened bread. And it's amazing to me. God provides whatever we need when we need it. And if we believe that, a huge burden is lifted from us. Okay? God provides whatever we need when we need it. So if you don't have it, you don't need it. Mm. Okay? And if you don't see how it's all going to work out without it, just wait. Be patient. God will take care of it. You know, that's, and that's the, I think that might be one of the most important lessons that we learn as faith gets old. You know, as I talk to, to our oldest people, uh, most of them gr have grasped that. Is that, eh, God will be there. You know, God will be there. When, when, if I need him, God will be there. You know, and they might laugh about it. They might say, well, I don't know how we're going to get through this. Ha, ha, ha. But they, they don't really, they're not really worried. You know, because they know God will be there. There's no doors for that wind anyway. It's the kids' bathroom. Oh, over there. Oh, so that one's right there. I didn't know where you oh, went. I went to the yeah. clinic. Oh, there's no doors. I'm not going in. No. <laughs> no one wants to see me. If I, uh, if I got down on one of those toilets, you would, you would have, I'd have to call one of you to come help me. Oh, I did. I Because it's, I did it's about this far off the ground. It is. It is. I looked at it like... I can squat there. I'm, I've squatted a many horse. <laughs> yeah, I would need a winch. You'd have to call the. You'd have to call nine one one. Yeah, we need you to come up and get past her off the toilet. They are really Yeah, because the little the little preschool toilets. Yeah. Yeah, that was the preschool. Yeah. All right. So yeah, the right through that door is, is the is the grown up bathroom. Right here. Yeah. Is the grown up bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, this is a bathroom you're saying? Yeah, yeah. that's my bathroom right through there. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but I let other people use it occasionally. For yeah. cost. There's, For there's a jar on the on the back of the toilet to put a quarter in. I have a question. If, I, and I'm, I'm always afraid I'm going to drop the wafer. Mm -hmm. What happens if somebody drops it as you are passing it for communion? Some people just pick it up and eat it. Like I, That's what I would do because, you know, a three-second rule. Uh, but some people don't want to do that, and they can hand it back to me, and I'll take it out and crumble it on the ground, or I'll eat it. My, I'll, actually, honestly, I eat it myself most of the time. Uh, most of the time that there's a dropped wafer, unless it's dropped into something or stepped on or like that, mm -hmm. I just eat it. I consume it. Yeah. Well, Wade and I don't do the hate. Right. We take it directly. Is there? Are you supposed to do it? I, I, my personal matter? preference is to receive it directly into my mouth. I don't like put, having it in my hand. So when I receive Holy Communion from somebody else, I have them put it in my mouth, which causes great consternation <laughs> to pastors who don't like doing that because they don't know what to do. And they stand there like, oh, I just, I just look at them. <laughs> I'm not going with that. <laughs> so <laughs> Sarah's had that battle in, in, with her pastors in the South, you know, because none of them like to do the directly. And she has one who, who would not give up. He just he just stood there until she put her hand out. <laughs> but yeah, I like receiving it directly in my mouth because for me, it, re it that reminds me that I do nothing to receive this. I receive it directly from the hand. There's Dr. Bill doing now chiming in. <laughs> uh, I receive directly from uh, the pastor what the Lord gave him to give me. Oh man. I swear, how awkward. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and the and the and that's why I take from the common cup as well. Is that is that I is as the least amount of involvement. I want the least amount of involvement possible, so that you know some people don't even touch the chalice. Uh, but I tell people. If you get drowned or you don't get any, don't whine to me. You know, okay. I suggest you take the bottom of the chalice and tilt it. You only have to just tilt it. Just let me know, you know especially if you have big hair or wear a hat. Uh, you know, I mean, it's impossible. I can see nothing, you know. So it's, it's, you know, also not a fan of a shot of Jesus with individuals. But that's just me. <laughs> yeah, my whole family is that we're pretty much the common cut people. Uh, but that's just the way I was raised too. Uh, and I would, when I grew up, we didn't have individual cups uh, in one church. In another church, we all universally hated individual cups because they were all glass. 
Mm. And they all had to be washed. Mm. And my mother was on the altar guild. Yeah. yeah, so we would be sitting in the at the church for an extra half hour washing little individual cups because they didn't have dishwashers for that, you know. So we all took the common cup, and I, I can still remember, I think it was my one of my siblings, I don't remember who it was, looking at me and saying, don't. When <laughs> then the individual came by, don't. <laughs> yeah, like, oh yeah, don't want to do that. You have to dirty another one. I have to wash it. So. Okay, uh, next comes a man with his first fruits that are supposed to be offered to the priest. So we know uh, Exodus twenty three says uh, tw- Exodus twenty three nineteen says the best of the first fruits of the ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. So you take you take whatever you gather, you take the best of that, and you take that to the Lord. Okay. It's no different than what we say today, right? When it comes to giving offerings to the church, you take off the top. You don't say, well, I'll see if I have any money left over at the end of the month. Because if that's your attitude, you won't. you're you never going to have anything left to give. You just Because it's always, and I'm telling you, if you have, if you, whatever it is, whatever amount you decide, that's I'm going to give that at the end of the month, Satan will find a way to use that money up. Okay? Where if you give it off the top, he's got no choice. You know, and you just trust the Lord to provide. Now, let's let's be clear about this. You know, I, I, I always have to give the caveat. You start where it is reasonable. So I can't decide Sunday, you know what, Donnie and I are gonna give five thousand dollars a week. That's just the way we're gonna do it. We're gonna, I'm gonna write a check for five thousand dollars a week. That's not reasonable based on what the Lord provides, what I think the Lord's gonna provide for me. So I have to give something that's reasonable. And I always tell people when it comes to tithing, start with a percentage that you know you can do. So if that's 1%, half a percent, 20%, whatever it is, look at how much you make or you think you're going to make. None of us really know how much we're going to make, right? But we, this is what we think we're going to make. And say, I'm going to give the Lord a percentage of that, and this is the percentage I'm going to give. Okay? And then stick with that high, hell or high water the whole year. And at the end of the year, you're going to find that the Lord has blessed you more than you thought. And you're going to say, well, I think I can increase my percentage. And I'm going to go up to this percentage. And you keep doing that. And then, I mean, I've known people who have gotten to 30 and 35%. Because, they don't even feel it. No. Yeah. No. No. They just keep on adding on every year and saying, well, we can give more. And you do that every I don't do it every week. I give once a month, but that's, I mean, you can do it however you want to. Yeah, I, I like to give once a month. I always, that's just the easiest for me. I just take it off the top of the, fir- of the month, first paycheck of the you month. You shouldn't have to give. Why? Because you give in service. And with your so wife. do you. So does Mary. So does Jamie. So does Mark. All of us give. Yeah. It's, the, the, You're a little different. Maybe. The, the point yeah. of giving, my sister in law used to say the same thing. My sister in law used to say, Why do you give to the church? You're just giving to your own paycheck. That's what I'm saying. It's like me giving to the state of Illinois. Like, yeah, I do. Yeah, actually, you do. <laughs> Think about it. You certainly do. <laughs> yeah. So it's two separate things, right? One thing is, it's the church's responsibility to take care of my needs financially so that I can, so that I can take care of all the spiritual stuff that goes on here. To the extent that they can't do that, I may have to go get another job. Let's say they came and said, you know, Pastor, we can't afford to pay you anymore. Uh, well, I still have a call here. It's still my job, uh, my calling to be here. The pastor, I may have to go get a job at Walmart and be a Walmart greeter to make up the difference. But that ha- that's completely separate. Okay, but so it's the church's job to take care of my needs so that I can serve them. It's my job to give my first fruits to the Lord. Okay. What the Lord does with that is his business, not mine. Now, so there are some pastors who I've known, yeah, give of time, talent, and treasures, uh, from the voice of global. Um, tw- time, talent, and treasures, yeah, because not everybody has as much treasure to give, so they give more time and talent. Some people have lots of treasure, and they give lots of treasure, and they maybe don't give as much time and talent. So it's, it's all three, it's, it's uh, uh, giving. Uh, not one thing or the other, uh, but it all balances out. And the, you know, the, the key is is that you just keep asking yourself, "What more can I give? You know, what more can I give? Can I give more time? Do I have an, an ability or a talent uh, that the, that would serve the Lord? 
in the church, or or maybe not this church, but maybe somewhere else, maybe in LWML or the synodical offices or the district, or do I have ways that I can do that? It's always a matter of trying to increase the amount of, of giving, time, talent, and tithe. And you're always going to find the Lord blesses you richly. So this guy comes in to Elisha. He's bringing the first fruits to Elisha probably because the, the temple was in such disarray. Uh, this, is, this is now in the time of the divided kingdom. Uh, may not have been able to get to the temple. Uh, so he brought it to the prophet. Uh, it reminds me of, we had a, a, a girl one time here um, who was just kind of brand new to Christianity. And she was, she was very excited about giving. Uh, whatever she was giving, she was very excited to giving. And one Sunday she had a headache, uh, had a migraine. In certain, and she wasn't. She just fit, did, couldn't wait for the offering, and so all of a sudden, I'm in the middle of the sermon, and I see her walking up the aisle, and I look, and I, what is she doing? And she keeps walking forward, and I'm preaching, you know, and it's, I'm telling you, I, I make a joke about people in the wrong pew, but it really is distracting, you know. I'm out there up there preaching, and say, wait a minute, why are they back? What are the goals is doing over there? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah. uh, so anyway, so she's walking up the aisle, and she takes her offering envelope, she throws it up on the top of the of the pulpit, and walks away because it was that important to her. She had and her one of her family members said, "What? Why did you do that?" She oh, she had to leave. She says, "I couldn't stay in church anymore. And I had to make sure that my offering got there." So she couldn't wait for the offering plates, so she threw it at the pastor. You know, and so, yeah. And that's fine, you know, because, the, and that's exactly what this guy did. It's, I can't get to the temple, so I'll go to the pastor, and I'll give the first fruits to him. So Elisha says, uh, you know, well, okay, we'll, we'll just use these first fruits to feed the sons of the prophets, who apparently still hadn't had enough, uh, enough food after their uh, stew was fixed. Um, so he uh, tells them to do that. And there, don't be ridiculous, Elisha. There's no way, we don't have anywhere near enough food to fit, feed 100 people here. Uh, and, of course, you know that that's the, where that story is mirrored in the New Testament. Oh, yeah. Jesus feeds the 4,000 and Jesus feeds the 5,000. He did it twice. You know, uh, 4,000 men, 5,000 men, not counting all the women and children that were with him. And those were so. the miracles of creation. I mean, just like the oil previous on this. Mm -hmm. Those are those are incredible miracles because they're they're actual miracles of creation. Good. Well, and that's a really an interesting point because one of the things that we sometimes forget is that God invites us to create with Him. Hmm. You know, that's really kind of a cool thing when you think about the way God draws us into creation and helps us to create things. You know, when we when we baptize a child in church as a congregation that's why i insist on doing it in front of the congregation i don't have private baptismal services unless the child's sick or something like that there's some kind of reason for it in the hospital or whatever um but generally i would say no we we, we only baptize in the worship services because that is a miracle you and i are invited to participate in to to be part of that child being brought into the holy spirit to the making of a christian because once that child's baptized we don't just, you know, send them out on the step somewhere and say, okay, hope it turns out all right for you. You know, we, we, there's all this talk today about the viability of when a child is viable. You can talk the same way about a Christian. You know, when is a Christian viable? But then don't they um, have to have then, uh, in addition to baptism, this is something I've been really trying to understand. The whole being born again, having the whole, it's when the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that is born again. Baptism is born again. And then, what, whole, remember what Jesus says. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all these things I have commanded you. You do both. Baptism and teaching. So that's why we baptize, and then we have all kinds of Sunday school and Bible classes and confirmation and all that to teach. So it's both and. It's not either or. So all these babies... But, but that are, is... But there, are, but there are like... Okay, so I'm trying to... There's like... When, when the Holy Spirit goes into you and it gives you faith, like there's, mm -hmm. I've read, I don't know where it was, that power, and strength, and reason, you can't, is not enough to ha believe in Jesus Christ. It is something given to you by the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. that belief. And that is separate from baptism. No, no. 
It's all given to you at baptism. Okay. Yep. Those little babies. babies. But then what about the people who are baptized who don't believe? They do. So it wasn't given to them. They, they do. You can always reject. Okay. You always have that. God will not drag you into heaven kicking and screaming. You always have the power to reject him. So, okay, when you're baptized, what happens is faith is created. And faith is like my African violet. Okay? I can put my African violet in the sun. I can give it water. I can give it African violet food. It's going to thrive and bloom and prosper and be beautiful. I can also put it in the closet and not water it. It's going to die. Mm -hmm. Okay, faith, faith is a living thing that God gives us. But if we choose to ignore it and, and, and starve it, it'll die. And then, we, then what we would say is we rejected our baptism. We didn't really. We just let it die. We let our faith die. Mm -hmm. And it is true. It's like what I found with myself personally. The more I go to church, like you were saying, feed your faith, feed your mm -hmm. faith. And the more I go to church, the more that I, the more water I give my plant and, mm -hmm. and sunlight. Um, more prosperous. The, the more I really believe in this, and the right. more I don't know, I feel, feel, about this. Mm -hmm. you know, that's hard. But yeah, I mean, so it is. Right. It becomes. A, it, it, it's a little bit like making a quilt. You know. When you, if, if, if you've ever watched people, I've never made a quilt, but I've watched people make quilts. And when you, sir, when you sew two squares together, that's not really a quilt, is it? <laughs> you know? But, but you sew, sew more and more and more, and one day you go in, and there's a whole quilt there. You know? I mean, it's a, and it's beautiful, and it all fits together. And, and that's how it is with, with Christianity, is that faith is created, it's one square. Um, let's see, how often do we doubt God when we think we know what is better. Okay? I feel that this is okay because it makes me feel good, so God must be ignored or excused. You know, how many times we have people doing what they want to do, and they'll say, well, I feel. I don't care what you feel. Yeah. What does God say? Okay? Keep going back to what does the word say. That was Luther constantly said. What does the word say? Right? And that was that was his argument with Zwingli about the Lord's Supper. Zwingli kept saying that it has to be, how could Jesus be present in heaven and on earth at the same time? doesn't make any sense. And Luther just kept on going back, what does the word say? This is my body. This is my blood. I don't know how it works. No one knows how it works. Jesus knows how it works. But it works because it does change you. It right. really, really, really does. Right. Yeah, yeah people who receive... The, the sacrament frequently have a different level of faith than people who don't. That is absolutely foundationally true. Uh, I have to take this unbiblical action because God's way will not solve my problem. How many times have you ever heard that? Well, I have to do this. You know, well, that's not, God's, that's not God's way. Well, you know, God's way won't work. How about we go God's way and wait? Because God's way will work. It may not work on, on your timetable, and it may not work the way you want it to work, but it will work. Uh, patient. Exactly. Mm -mm. No, instant, instant gratification. Uh, why do you think God places these miracles before us so many times in the Bible? You have this feeding of multiple people with small amounts several times. Why? To build faith, to strengthen to more evidence. Yeah, it would seem like you'd finally look at it and say, wow. God really is serious about providing for our needs. Mm -hmm. yeah. We really don't have to worry. Okay, I know. I do it too. You know, I, but oh yeah, but I've got this big bill coming up. How am I going to pay for this big bill? I don't know how I'm going to pay for this big bill. God's got it under control. You know, it's not my job to worry about stuff like that. <laughs> It's my job to be a good steward. If I'm being a, 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 a rotten steward, if I'm not giving to God if I'm, of my time, talent, and tithe, then, then I, I maybe, maybe I should worry. You know, but if you're being a faithful steward, if you're being faithful to God, don't worry about it. He'll take care of it. Uh, why do people resist believing in these miracles or believe that God will work a miracle in their lives? Why do they, why do they resist believing that God will work a miracle in their lives? That's the bottom line there. Why? Because I'm not in control. Here, I, constantly, and it's always the argument in my family, if there's there's so many horrible things going on, why isn't God intervening? Because the world is right. broken. And, you know, 
putting these miracles in front of my brother and my mother, mm-hmm. and you know, they still mm-hmm. don't buy it. It's just a story. Um, God is not the problem. He's not the cause of the evil things. He's the way out of the evil things. That's right. That's a good way of saying it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. People who get cancer, why does this mean? He didn't do this to <laughs> Chances are you probably had a role in life. You got this, yeah. But I don't say that. Yeah. But I do say, you know, this happened. God is the way out of it. It's, you know, he doesn't stop things, evil things from happening because no. he needs That's a great way to put it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he will walk with you through them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what he promises. The, I, lo, I will be with you always. Matthew uh, 28, uh, 18, uh, 28, 20. And lo, I will be with you always. I the end of the end of the age. People, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I wonder if that's why people doubt it. Because? Because when they see things. I think it's fundamentally yeah. because human beings like to have control. But what about when they see things like someone who, you know, say has cancer or something bad happened to them, and they count on God, you see it. And they get brought out of it. I mean, isn't that on the flip side proof to people like you're talking about right. that mm-hmm. that miracles that doctors see God that all does, the time. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, people Only people the, see that and they'll say, Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, that's because they had good medical treatment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just, and it's unfortunate, but it's you know you either you either come to a place where you believe that God is in control of everything, or you don't. You know, that's the reality, is that either God's in control of everything or he's not. And if God's in control of everything, then we don't have to worry about elections. We don't have to worry about world powers. We don't have to worry about North Korea. We don't have to worry about that stuff. God's in control. That's what I tell people. Everyone's, what would you you think that I go, I'm not worried about it. I go, I don't even want to talk about it. I have more more productive things to focus my mental energy on. I'm like, I don't worry about it at all because I know it's going to turn out right. I just know it. I know it. I'm not worried about it. it yeah. It's we have no. Why are you worried about something? You have, that's why I tell people. Why are you wasting your brain energy? It's only you only have so much. Why are you wasting on something you have no control over? It makes no sense to me. And getting arguments. The like, only what? question we have is, are we being a good steward of the things we've been given? That's really the only question we have, because God does. He demands good stewardship. So He says, "Look, I've given you all these gifts. I want you to use them. You know, I gave you a brain. Use it." You know, so, so, you know, I'm not suggesting ever when I talk about this about, you know, shooting up and sitting in an alley someplace and letting life go past you. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm, because God gave you a brain, God gave you a life, God gave you, you know, abilities. He expects you to use them to his glory. You know, that's what we pray every Sunday for the president is that he would have the will and the ability to use his gifts for God's glory, to make decisions for this nation for God's glory. That's what we pray for. Not that he would do it my way. Not that he would do it the right, the right way, which is really my way. You know, that's, that's always, anytime someone says the right way, that's what they really mean is my way. Uh, no, that, that he would do it in a way that glorifies God. You know, whatever he does, whatever, and, and he, we, we pray for him as a, as a signal for all of our leaders that, uh, that he would be able to, to glorify God, that we would be able to glorify God, because that's the key thing. God provides us all of these leaders to help us glorify God. You know, and sometimes they do a great job, sometimes they don't, but that's not our problem. You know, our problem is to continue praying for them, to do a better job of glorifying God. All right, that'll finish us up. I will be back uh, in time next, uh, I'll be back on Monday next Are week. Are we so two be, weeks? No, no, I'll be back. Oh. Because I'm, going, I'm leaving Thursday, but I'll be back Monday. So, so there's no Christian education Sunday? Pastor uh, Allen will do something. Oh, cool. I don't know what he does. Okay. He, that, that, that he, but this will be back Tuesday? We'll be back next Tuesday. Okay. Yep, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, writing on the wall. Daniel, mm. the writing on the wall. All right, let's close with the blessing. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord that of his countenance upon us and give us peace.